Good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for coming in such large numbers. I understand this is perhaps not the most convenient time of the year, certainly uh, not the most convenient weather for intellectual discussion of the sort, but it's really encouraging to see so many people deeply interested in the affairs of the world, and which is, as a matter of fact, the chief mission, the main mission of the Center for International Relations and Sustainable Development to bring Serbia closer to the world, to bring the world closer to Serbia, to improve the understanding of world affairs here in our part of the world. Uh, today's topic is uh, certainly amongst the most heated and uh, for sure the most complex and intricate uh, when it comes to world affairs and what is going on in the world. We will be talking about uh, the Middle East, the place uh, that uh, was the historic bedrock of civilizations and the theater of their interaction and uh, uh, recurrent conflict. The part of the world uh, which is occupying uh, a lot of international attention uh, in the past years. Uh, the 9-11 attacks, terrorist attacks on American soil have brought to an abrupt end the illusions about the end of history. And in the past 15 or so years in the Middle East, we've seen unravelings and fluctuations of the highest order. We've seen foreign interventions, people's uprisings. We've seen implosion of Syria. We've seen uh, the tragedy of Libya. We've seen transformation of Turkey. We were also witnesses of a perhaps historic nuclear deal with Iran. We have seen rise of extremism and many other tumults. But uh, right now, there seems to be a great unraveling in front of our eyes of the regional order that was set about 100 years ago by the agreement of Sykes and Pico. And some of its important components are the feelings of dispossession on behalf of Sunni Arabs, whose perhaps most grotesque manifestation is the Islamic State. Also, struggles between the competing forms of Islam, regional power frictions between the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Turkey. And last, but perhaps not least, the rivalry between America and the Russian Federation. Today's America's pronounced aims in the Middle East are to defeat terrorism, to roll back the growing influence of Iran, and to diminish America's direct engagement in the Middle East. Not everybody believes that these are fully consistent with each other. On the other hand, since 2015, we had a great comeback to the Middle Eastern scene of the Russian Federation for the first time since the Soviet era. Right now, there are few who can dispute that Russia plays an extremely important role in the region. Not everybody is fully thrilled about the role that Russia is playing, but few can argue that it is not a very, very important and strategic role. Today with us, we have two spectacular participants, spectacular experts. We're truly privileged to have them with us. The first is not a stranger in this neck of the woods. He did serve as ambassador of the United States to Serbia, after which uh, he continued with his career in the State Department, serving in ambassadorial point posts in uh, two uh, pretty tricky locations at strenuous times. One is Iraq and the other is Pakistan. Uh, he also had a distinguished academic career that uh, involves teaching at the University of California in Los Angeles, as well as Columbia Law School. He was also a fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School 
of government. He's currently the CEO and the president of the East West Institute of New York, one of America's foremost international policy think tanks. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the stage Ambassador Cameron Munter. And the second guest is uh, no less uh, prominent. And as a matter of fact, uh, uh, I need to, uh, to tell you that uh, I was once told by a top-level international uh, official if uh, the knowledge and understanding of the Middle East uh, were tennis, then the world's undisputed number one on the ATP list would be this very man, our guest in Belgrade today. He's currently the director of the Institute of Oriental Studies of the Russian Academy of Sciences, of which he is also a correspondent member. Uh, he's not only a prolific writer, an erudite, and polyglot, he is also someone who's had a uh, experience and career of engagement with the United Nations in various uh, advisory and ambassadorial posts first with the Alliance of Civilizations and, and also as a special political advisor to Stefan de Mastura, the UN Special Envoy for Syria. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please uh, join me in welcoming to the stage Vitaly Naumkin of uh, Moscow. have this uh, probably lengthy introduction, but I do believe that uh, the prominence of our guests of today deserves such a lengthy introduction. We're gonna try and uh, uh, have about uh, eight different sections with uh, eight questions each for, uh, all, for both of our participants. I would kindly ask you to try to stick to uh, three uh, minutes rule. This may not be possible in certain in certain parts, but uh, I would like also to have a chance uh, to give to give a chance to the audience to ask uh, to ask some questions at the end. And uh, if you allow me, I'm going to start off by Iraq because uh, a lot of people believe that uh, uh, this was a development that led to many other developments uh, which are uh, feeling right now today, and uh, I'm going to start off uh, by asking Cameron, former American ambassador in Iraq, uh, why on earth did you do it, and what went wrong? Well, first, thank, uh, uh, Vuk, I want to thank you, and I want to thank all of you for being here today. It's great to be able to discuss these kinds of issues with someone uh, who knows so much more about the Middle East than I do, so I hope I can get him to educate me a little bit. The one problem we see, of course, is that Vuk, ever acting as the non-aligned movement, didn't wear the proper suit, <laughs> right? We are aligned, Vuk is not. But the non-aligned movement still lives. My point uh, that I'd like to make very briefly in the two and a half minutes that I have left on, on Iraq is that America uh, went into Iraq at a time of its highest self-perception as the uh, unilateral and unipolar power. And there was a belief uh, among many people, the so-called neoconservatives uh, in the government of the United States, that they could remake the structure of the Middle East. That is to re redesign the chessboard of, of uh, that part of the world and uh, make uh, difficult as this may sound, to, to encourage what had been seen in, say, Central and Eastern Europe in 1989, to see in Iraq a kind of a revolution that would un, un, unleash the powers of democracy in the Middle East. Now, in retrospect, it seems naive, but that is what these people thought. There were those people in the State Department uh, who were skeptical about this, but the political leadership of the United States was convinced not that this would turn into a, uh, a slog, but that rather the Americans would be welcomed with flowers uh, as the liberators and the, um, 
the people who would establish a, a Middle East state without the restrictions of dictatorship, etc. cetera. Um, and history has shown that that was wrong. But that is indeed what the American government thought. Uh, for those people who have a more conspiratorial view, and there are many, they say the Americans went in for oil. Well, we were the only people who ran an actual a, uh, uh, a tender for the oil when the Americans didn't win any oil fields. Uh, they, people have said, well, they went in uh, for other reasons to take the side of one group or the other. In the long run, look, it's fair to say that uh, the influence of Iran uh, has done nothing but grow in Iraq uh, after the American uh, effort. So I guess the, the answer I would give to you, Vuk, on this is it uh, may seem difficult for people uh, who weren't around in Washington in the years 2001, 2002, 2003 to believe, but there was a belief that underneath the surface in Iraq, there was a democratic country seeking to arise, and that by taking away the dictatorship of Saddam Hussein, somehow this would create a, uh, a, a, uh, a center of, diplom of uh, democracy in, the, in, in, uh, in Iraq. I think America has learned a lesson, a very painful lesson, a very uh, expensive lesson, but that is indeed what America's thought at the time. Well, thank you very much, Cameron. Vitelli, do you buy this? What do you think? Why did America go into right, Iraq? First of, all, sorry. first of all, I'd like to say that uh, it's a distinct privilege and great honor for me to speak to this distinguished audience and to have uh, to use the same tailor with Cameron. <laughs> <laughs> The only difference is our ties. This is this can be associated with the Republican Party, which is <laughs> symbolic of the present-day Russia, given what's happening in our relationship. But uh, I cannot buy it properly well. Uh, I think uh, even if we can imagine that they were some idealistic, uh, you know, ideas about uh, promoting democracy, which uh, actually failed everywhere. Uh, the United States tried to make uh, regime change, which Russia is totally opposed to. Uh, but the question is there, what to do with these dictatorships? So I agree that probably Saddam Hussein was cruel, he was dictator. I remember when I had a meeting with, one of the meetings with uh, Mr. Henry Kissinger. Sorry, okay. I remember that one of the meetings, at one of the meetings with uh, Henry Kissinger, Kissinger uh, uh, and we were discussing Libya those, uh, at that time, he told me, yes, uh, Gaddafi was son of a bitch, but at least he, was, uh, he managed to keep this country together. Now this country is destroyed. The same happened with uh, Iraq. I'm not sure whether this country is capable to hold uh, it together. And uh, there are many, many problems there. So everybody understands. I'm, I'm, I agree that the United States probably has learned lessons from this experience of three great uh, dire mistakes that were made. First, destroying, uh, decommissioning the whole army. And part of it went to ISIS later on, the Sunni officers. Then destroying the bureaucratic uh, dissolving this bureaucratic apparatus of this uh, state, which is probably could have been one of the wealthiest, uh, if not the wealthiest state in the Middle East. It has all resources, very talented people, and so on. And then uh, the uh, ban on the Ba'ath Party. And uh, I think this mistakes uh, played its very negative role in the days of, uh, but what I agree with uh, in, in, in Cameron's posture is that, uh, of course, uh, the, uh, the um, Shia project by the United States, the idea to bring Shia majority to power and reliance upon two fundamentalist parties, the party of Dao and the party of High, High Council of the Islamic Revolution. Uh, by the way, we had yesterday in Moscow meetings between our leadership and Mr. Maliki, who is still playing a very important role in the uh, Iraqi establishment. It, uh, it uh, happened, it, it um, helped Iran to take over 
Iraq and to turn it into its main sphere of influence. I'm sure that uh, every uh, that, that, that people in Washington are going to be thrilled by the fact that you were talking to Maliki yesterday in Moscow. But uh, uh, to now, to be fair, I started off by asking Cameron, why did you guys go into Iraq? I'm going to now ask you, Vitaly, why did you guys go into Syria? It was a different story. We had nothing to do with uh, democracy in Syria. And uh, we had uh, nothing to do with the uh, removal uh, of uh, Mr. Assad. So uh, given the lessons learned from uh, Libya, we'll probably will come later to that. I, I hope so. Uh, so uh, the idea was to rely upon certain philosophy of international relations, not to interfere to meddle in the uh, internal affairs of this, uh, of this state. There was a conflict, but our support of the legitimate regime, as we see it, uh, against terrorism and against the intervention of internal uh, forces, mainly these terrorist groups in the internal affairs of, 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 of Assad, was, uh, was the main idea. And uh, please keep in mind that we haven't brought our land forces into uh, Syria. It was only uh, the operation by our air forces, and these air forces, this air force, uh, was relying upon, as boots on the ground, on the Syrian army, Syrian forces, and also it played three different fa functions. Demonstrated, first, its ability to support the Syrian army from air, second, uh, to provide humanitarian access, humanitarian aid. So hundreds of tons of humanitarian aid were airdropped by the Russian planes. And uh, <laughs> humanitarian convoys, also convoys, were also uh, you know, uh, guarded and, and, and led by the Russian, Russian uh, forces. And uh, third, uh, there is a center of reconciliation. So we have now more than uh, 2,000 uh, Different, city, uh, different towns and villages who signed agreements about ceasefire, and it was also one of the functions of the uh, Russian contingent in Syria. Now I'm going to ask you the same question, Cameron. Do you buy this? It makes sense uh, in the sense that I think that there was an effort by the Russian Federation to bolster the uh, stability of the, of the country. I think this comes down to the debate about uh, whether or not there is stability or whether or not there is to be uh, a more democratic structure. And so the differences within the American debate about Syria is if you are looking for someone who is playing the role that, say, Saddam Hussein played, you would look to someone like uh, Assad, who uh, would be the traditional leader of a country and would try to keep a lid on things. Um, one of the great debates now in the United States is whether or not America should be a country that tries to uh, support uh, the kind of uh, democratic values, uh, the um, you know human rights kinds of uh, problems that clearly uh, Assad has been accused of violating and to what extent it's the work of the international community or the United States or other, other groups to try to intervene on that behalf. So this is where the question comes down. If you are looking for a question of stability, I think it makes a lot of sense from the Russian point of view to say uh, keeping this person in power uh, is uh, an effort to try to keep things as they were, to keep a lid on things. And the then greater and, and more troubling debate is how, in fact, in the wake of the Arab Spring, if you want to call it the Arab Awakening, how do we, on the outside, how do those of us who are not in the Middle East uh, respond to the desire of people in that region for a greater uh, democracy, for a greater openness? And this is an open question. We're still debating it. Well, that's uh, it's very interesting. Uh, I really didn't expect such a reconciliatory tone from you, but uh, that's, that's perhaps very much appreciated as we move forward and where the work, uh, the joint work with Russia and America is definitely going to be necessary as we move forward. Wait, 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 if I can Please add do. to that a couple of words, 
of the same Absolutely. reconciliatory tone. Please do. Uh, saying that we're not supporting one you know, man in Syria, and we're not regarding Assad as the lifelong president of, of Syria. More of that, we saw public opinion and our political establishment criticize the response uh, of Assad to the first you know, uh, uprising when it was peaceful mm -hmm. and uh, demonstrations and so on and so forth. It doesn't mean that we approve everything he's doing, but now uh, we are supporting this legitimate government. We're considering it as legitimate uh, despite all, all, all grievances of some people there. And let's not uh, to forget that during the 10 years uh, presence of the coalition forces in Iraq, more than at least somewhere between, in, in accordance with the American estimates, think tanks in Washington, D.C., at least more than half a million people have been killed. Oh, yeah. I'm not accusing our American partners. We are partners now in Syria, by the way, and uh, of anything, but they were not capable to provide security and stability in Iraq, despite of the presence of this contingent. And now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay in Syria, but but that's also related to Iraq in a, in a way. Um, a few days ago, last week, 10 days ago, uh, we held a, we, we, we saw a, uh, a liberation of Mosul. Now liberation, some people would have difficulties in calling it liberation because of the massive destruction that was inflicted. Um, not unlike in Aleppo. Uh, but anyway, the IS, seems to have been perhaps not defeated by the territorialized in Iraq and something similar seems to be on its way in Raqqa and Syria. So there is definitely a, uh, a big advance in the fight against the territorially defined caliphate. But what do you see as the future of a fight against extremism? Is, that, is, is, is this defeat or deterioration of ISIS, is that going to bring about a significant change when it comes to extremist threat? Yeah, I think it's very important, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that Raqqa will be liberated. The uh, Americans who are supporting, uh, who also as Russians uh, need the boots on the ground, and we're relying upon the Syrian army, and the Americans are relying upon the so-called Syrian Democratic uh, Forces, mainly consisting of the Kurds, of the YPG, which is, by the way, it's a very complicated issue because it's regarded by the Turks as a, as a terrorist organization. And uh, uh, some people, some Sunni states are looking at the uh, Hezbollah, which is supporting uh, the Syrian army, also as a terrorist organization. So it's a mixture of different uh, conflicting attitudes but still the Americans are relying upon this uh, uh, YPG plus the Arab tribes. But uh, the question is going to be what is going to happen with the people who have been members of, of the ISIS or who lived there. For instance, there are some uh, you know, problems like what to do with all these children that have been brought there in this very violent and barbaric atmosphere what to do with the people who are still sympathizing to, to ISIS. We still, we now, in Russia, given what's happening there, it's on the brink of, of being defeated, this terrorist organizations. We still have people who are willing to go to Turkey and then to Syria to live there and to fight, to help ISIS. There are sympathizers everywhere in the world. The uh, ISIS is turning to the strategy of sleeping cells, of dissolving uh, in, uh, uh, among the tribes, and on, on, of uh, building more franchises all over the world, for instance, in the, in the Mindanao, in the Philippines, recently uh, uh, we found out that there were some Chechens, they have been sent uh, to, to terrorists uh, from, by, from ISIS to Mindanao, to the Philippines. What to do there? Do you think that there is a danger of uh, such cells being formed here in this part of the world? I think uh, nothing can be excluded, you know. We have to be aware of that. That's why we need cooperation. We need cooperation between the United States and Russia. We need cooperation <coughs> between all players, including this part of the world, against this terrorist, terrorist uh, extremist ideology, which is not dead, which hasn't been defeated yet. Do you agree, Cameron, that it wasn't, that it wasn't actually defeated and uh, 
despite these military victories in Mosul and the likely one coming in Raqqa, uh, do you think that we can expect as a result of this uh, easing up of tensions in Europe or like less uh, threats of attacks? No, I very much agree that uh, the, the war is not at all over. Uh, if you see this strictly as a military operation, it's a success. But if you look at it as the way that, say, Clausewitz or someone would look at, at a question, you need to have a political goal, and the political goal would be to eliminate the basis under which ISIS gains international support. Mm -hmm. And that is still something that uh, the, um, uh, the countries, you know, Europe, Russia, America, other countries are trying to struggle with. And we, um, while it's a good thing to, uh, to eliminate the territorial uh, uh, kind of headquarters of ISIS, I very much agree that the, the fight has in many ways just begun. And the fight, for example, could be uh, uh, the demonstration to the people who might be drawn to an, uh, a radical ideology might be the generosity of countries like Europe, Russia, America coming together to rebuild Mosul where I lived, actually, uh, as, as a diplomat. You were actually leading the first oh. reconstruction team. I, I lived there and, 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 and for a long time, and so it's tragic to me very personally for the destruction of the monuments that were there. Um, but to rebuild Aleppo, to rebuild Raqqa when this war is over, to show a certain amount of generosity, not just because it's a humanitarian catastrophe, but to show that the rest of the world cares about the suffering these people have gone through. If the world can show that, I think it'll go a long way towards undercutting the argument from the IS that the West, that the other countries don't care. And I think ideas of this sort, as Vitaly has said, if we can do them in tandem, we will be much better. I'm not sure that'll be possible, I hope it will, but it's going to be uh, a job not only for the military experts who are good at killing the bad guys, but it's got to be a job for the political experts to say, how do we demonstrate to the people of that region that we care about the suffering they've gone through and not leave them hopeless and looking to other solutions such as IS gives? So how about, like, should we be scared in Europe where this is now a part? I think that Europe has to be very careful. Europe has to be on its guard. And this is going to be the case for a long time. For a long time. So before we move on to the next issue, just a quick and quick yes or no answer. If you had to bet today, in three years from now, uh, will Assad be the president of Syria? Yes or no? Uh, why exactly three years? Probably even four, because, <laughs> <laughs> because um, one of the options is that uh, Assad, I'm just speculating on that. There are different options put on the table. One of the options is that uh, of course, despite the fact that we are in favor of uh, political transition, Russia uh, voted for resolution uh, 2254 of the Security Council of the United Nations, which envisages political transition, new constitution and elections, and even certain roadmap for that. But there are a lot of options because nobody uh, specified what this transitional governing body means. Is the Geneva Communique of the 30th of June 2012, and what political transition means? There are very difficult negotiations in Geneva. This track one political track. There is military and security track in Astana, and hopefully uh, the uh, Americans will, will will participate more actively in this track. And then in Jordan we have another track. Between where Russia we agreed America. on many things, but I can say that one of the options is that probably for the period of transition until the, uh, the end of his term as a president in 21, uh, he might, if besides agree about that, he might remain uh, with some amendments to the existing constitution at his post, being probably deprived, deprived of, some, uh, of some of his functions and so on. But it's up to the Syrians to decide Sorry. who is going to rule them, not Russians well, and the It's our... Thank you very much for it. I, I was hoping for a yes or no answer. But like, <laughs> thank you very much. I think it was really, really educational and constructive. Can I ask you, Cameron, to give me a yes or no in three years from now? Is Assad going to be president of Syria? Can I give you four? Words? Yeah, four words. I have no idea. Oh, good. <laughs> good.
Great. Much right. better answer. Okay. So uh, a clear yes and God knows. Uh, it looks like it's going to be there if you ask me. But uh, now let's go on to, uh, to the latest crisis, latest diplomatic crisis that, uh, that we had uh, unfold over the past uh, few weeks, uh, a month actually. And this is the Gulf crisis between Qatar and uh, uh, the group of Sunni Arab countries led by the Kingdom of, of Saudi Arabia. Uh, seems to be very tense. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any climb down in sight uh, in a place where a vast proportion of world oil is flowing towards world markets. And uh, Turkey sending troops there. America already has 10,000 troops in Qatar, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so, Vitaly, what is behind this? Where did this come from? Why is this bitter? division and diplomatic crisis between the uh, allies inside the Gulf Cooperation Council? I think there is uh, some uh, process, sorry, some process of, which is of global, of a global character, of some, uh, uh, you know, uh, collapse of the uh, global order we've been accustomed to. So there are the, all societies are now more divided, and there are more contradictions, more competition everywhere, and including the United States of America. What we see now in the United States is sort of very deep divisions within this very smooth and, you know, uh, uh, society, which is unusual for us to, to see. And in the Middle East, you know, we have a number of failed states. We have a number of uh, deeply divided societies, very fragmented, very high competition. And this organization, which is uh, Gulf Cooperation Council, uh, Council is living through the period of, uh, if not collapse, but severe crisis. It's not the first crisis there, but it's mostly competition between the main players. Between, from the one hand, we have this boycott quartet, quartet which is Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, Bahrain, and, uh, and Egypt as well. Each of them have their own agendas. For instance, for Egypt, it's mainly confronting Muslim brothers. For the Emirates, it's the same, because the Muslim Brotherhood is regarded as the internal uh, threat right. for the Emirates, because they have penetrated into the tribes, uh, no, nothing, uh, no, nowhere else but in the Gulf. But why not in Qatar? Why, why not Qatar is, is supporting the Muslim Brotherhood. It's Muslim the Muslim. main supporter of the Muslim Brotherhood, on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, they try to establish good relations with the whole world. With, uh, they're diversifying relations with whoever, and including Iran which is detrimental to the main agenda priority of Saudi Arabia to confront Iran because the main uh, you know, collision is between Iran and, and, and Saudi Arabia there. Oh, by the way, Qatar, and we, we're in favor of, uh, we want reconciliation. We need good partner there. And uh, Russia is supporting the mediation of, by Kuwait, which, is, which can bring uh, fruits in my view, and it couldn't be solved because the, these contradictions are not as much deep. And uh, I can add to that that Qatar is one of the main investors in Russia. They have bought 17% Rosneft. Rosneft, of the uh, shares, uh, the second uh, largest uh, you know, group uh, oil, oil company in the world after Exxon Mobil. And uh, they also invested, I think it's something like $2 billion in the uh, former foundation of the direct investments in Russia, which has been turned recently into Russia's sovereign fund mm -hmm. in order to allow us, this sovereign fund, to, to deal with the sovereign funds in the Arab Gulf mainly, mm -hmm. including Saudi Arabia, including Bahrain, including the Emirates. So it's very fruitful cooperation between Russia and Saudi Arabia also, in, in, and a lot of new achievements. So you, you did mention divisions in the US, and some of them seem to be very open uh, when it comes to this particular issue, President Trump uh, seemed to have taken a very hawkish stance on Qatar, uh, and uh, there seems to be uh, a somewhat of a more nuanced, I would say, attitude of uh, the State Department and, and the Pentagon in particular. Are there divisions in America on this? And uh, how do you expect this to unfold? Well, well I think I would just uh, 
uh, emphasize something that Vitaly has said, that m even though he, re he referred to it in a broad sense as a global issue, it's actually a local issue. Each of these countries is going through uh, the primacy, if you will, of domestic politics, where you have the efforts for reform within Saudi Arabia uh, defining a number of the foreign policy decisions they're making, the, the, the efforts to try to uh, stop what they see as Iranian uh, development or uh, influence in the region, the outreach that the Saudis are making, for example, to the Israelis, and the unusual situation that we see in the Middle East, that what used to be a dividing line, which was Israel on the Palestinian issue versus all of the Arabs, no longer as strong an issue, where you have Israel, Egypt, perhaps Jordan, mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia, looking at Iran as a problem. In other words, there's one thing which is the international politics here. One thing is the domestic politics in each country, which is leading people to make choices in a more difficult situation. Add to that what you have mentioned, which is that in America, there is a switch that has gone on. It's been perceived by many, whether this is fair or not, that the Obama administration stepped back somewhat from the Middle East, that after the president's speech, President Obama's speech in 2009 in Cairo, that there was a certain uh, promise that was made, it was perceived, and that it was not backed. Now, whether or not that's a fair assumption, it's a widely held assumption in the region, and President Trump has had to struggle with, how do I come up with a policy that uh, that defends American issues, interests in the region, and stands up for traditional American allies in the region. This has ended up being, if I can give a kind of a, a simple uh, mm -hmm. dis uh, description of it, strong support for Israel, strong support for Saudi Arabia. Now the problem is that American interests in the region, especially American il uh, military and economic interests, are much more uh, diverse mm -hmm. and sophisticated. So what you called a division between the State Department and the Pentagon and the President is what I would call the complexity of American interests in, in the, region. the region. Add to that the American commitment to the a nuclear deal with Iran from the previous administration, which uh, was an attempt in the long run to try to see if the these kinds of tensions could be defanged. And what you have is a number of decisions that are going to be coming up, at least in American politics, on are we able to play a very complicated game or are we going to make it very simple? Are we going to make it a uh, support for is, uh, Saudi against the Iranians? Or are we going to be able to try to be balanced and nuanced as I think American policy has tried to be for the last decades? It's, it's, it's really difficult to imagine a simple, one-dimensional, clear-cut solutions to, to Middle Eastern uh, issues, but that's certainly for America to decide. But since you did mention this Iran deal, uh, I'll, I'll come back to the Gulf, but I want to I ask you about Iran deal. This is arguably one of the most strategic developments uh, of the last decade, and certainly of Obama's era inside Middle East. Um, and there were lots of uh, grumblings about that, in particular in the United States, but it, it, it went through. Uh, but right now, we have uh, signals from American um, officials that, uh, that President Trump is actually considering not extending the sanctions suspension. Uh, that this is an intrinsic part of the deal, in a way that uh, saying that America believes that Iran doesn't stick, is not sticking to the deal. Uh, is there a danger of that happening? And if that happens, is the deal going to be dead? And does that lead to an elevated danger of a military conflict with Iran, be it Israel's or America's or Saudi Arabia's or anybody's? Well, I'm, uh, to be quite open with you, I'm a, I'm a supporter of the deal. Uh, the deal was an attempt to try to get uh, the uh, short-term limits on the nuclear capacity of uh, Iran in order to see whether during the time, the 15 years that we might see, that there might be developments bringing Iran into the mainstream 
of uh, international uh, institutions and to make the prospect of a nuclear Iran less scary. That is to say, trying to say that we would have faith with what would happen in the next 15 years. I was in support of that. There is skepticism on the American side, and not only on the American side, about the ability of Iran to comply with the spirit as well as the letter of this agreement. That is to say, even though this agreement is about nuclear arms, there are other elements, other activities that the Iranians have engaged in that are not encouraging. That said, I'm not a diplomat anymore, but I would still support this agreement. Should the agreement be abrogated, and as you know, the Americans uh, just agreed, President Trump just agreed that yes, uh, the compliance is still good for the next 90 days. Yeah. Um, uh, should that continue, I'm optimistic that outreach to Iran is probably a good thing. Mm -hmm. Should that be abrogated, should the Americans decide in another 90 days to stop it, to stop it, it would certainly throw a, uh, a, a challenge, not only to the Iranians, not only to the, everyone in the region, but to our uh, 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 colleagues in the United Nations, the Russians, the Chinese, the Europeans, who had all worked with us on this deal. So it would not only be a challenge to the region, it would be a challenge at the international multilateral level to try to figure out what would be the next steps. And I can only say from my personal point of view, I'm very apprehensive if that were to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to stay with Iran, and, uh, and I'm going to stay with this uh, very complex, um, triangular relationship between Iran, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and Turkey, which is, I believe, the, the best possible proof that uh, in the Middle East uh, what doesn't apply is that an enemy of your enemy is your friend. It's actually not necessarily a friend, and it could be like an even better an enemy. So this is a strategic triangle between Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Turkey. Uh, briefly, if you can, how do you expect this to evolve in the coming years? And do you think that there is a danger of, uh, of a thing, of an accident leading to a military conflict of a wider proportion in the region, but perhaps even bigger one, uh, like uh, about 100 years ago, one such uh, trigger in the Balkans led to a much wider military conflict. Of course, such, uh, such danger exists. I think that I, uh, it's not uh, coming back, starting for, with the, this nuclear deal, because it's important in, in, in this triangle as well, uh, that it's not a challenge, it's a disaster if, it, if it's going to, to collapse. And it will be very significant, uh, you know, uh, stroke, or I would say danger also, and threat to the uh, ongoing uh, cooperation within the United Nations, the P5 plus 1, and all other formats. You know, but coming to this triangle, there are, so, by the way, so many triangles in the Middle East that sometimes we are disoriented, you know, which triangle you, you actually you mean. It's one of those. But still, the main competition within this triangle, between these giants which are there, <clears throat> by the way, the powers that have benefited from the so-called Arab Spring uh, are non-Arab states. So formerly there were three giants in the Arab world who were the most influential, Egypt, Syria, and Iraq. Now we have Israel, Iran, and Turkey who have benefited from that. And plus Saudi Arabia who is trying to be, uh, you know, like a leader in the Arab and Islamic world. So there is competition between Saudi Arabia and Turkey, especially now given that Turkey is supporting the Muslim Qatar. Brotherhood and Qatar. The mainly Muslim Brotherhood was regarded by many actors as a threat or as an enemy. And we have this uh, competition between Iran and Saudi Arabia of a sectarian character, but also political character, economic character, big competition of a military character, mm -hmm. strategic one, especially given what's happening in, uh, for instance, in Yemen. Look uh, at this uh, poor country which it's a is suffering. It's disintegrating state. Yes, it's, it's a total no, disaster. Uh, and they, uh, yes, it's real humanitarian disaster in, the, in accordance with the data in the United Nations. More than uh, uh, six million people are doomed, you know, are, can, can die from, from hunger. 
Calera. By the end of this year, there, will, there would be uh, like 600,000 cases of cholera infected people. You know, and nobody cares about that, by the way. Everybody is, uh, is, 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 is thinking on, in, in very limited terms, more uh, on, on the Syrian conflict, but not in Yemen. But it's very important for the fate of this triangle in, in general, the situation in the Middle East, especially because Saudi Arabia is deeply involved in this uh, inter-Yemeni conflict. And, um you, you did mention Yemen, and this is one of the most difficult situations perhaps in the whole world right now. Uh, but you did mention Libya earlier on, and uh, it is also one of the states that have all but disappeared in front of our eyes after a military intervention, uh, international military intervention. Uh, I want to ask you, why did Russia let it happen in the Security Council? Why did Russia not oppose Libya intervention like it did oppose 2003 Iraq intervention and later on in several instances uh, an intervention in Syria? It was a mistake. It, it was a mistake, a clear-cut mistake. Uh, the public opinion in Russia was against this decision. But there was some, uh, you know, hope that uh, there would be uh, just uh, compliance with the format, with the mandate of this resolution, which was violated by the international, by our Western uh, partners, who violated uh, or, or uh, crossed the limits of this uh, international mandate of the resolution 1973 uh, with the direct intervention there. And we know what happened. We have now three uh, governments competing with, the, with each other. We have uh, 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 just smuggling of arms and, and drugs and everything. We have a lot of terrorist groups. And, and Libya is in a very difficult shape. I can uh, remember that, that uh, because we are discussing our strategies with, with Cameron, you know, Russia's view is that the, to preserve the uh, uh, existing borders and the unity of all these states, including we are against any partition, any cessation, uh, secession uh, in, 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 in either Syria or, or Libya or whatever. But Russia uh, worked very hard, and uh, this, the Libyans remember this, that in 21, Russia supported Libya when there was no United State there. In uh, 1950, then the Soviet Union proposed uh, a resolution to the General Assembly to unite three parts of the present day. Syria, Fitsan, Syrianaika, and Tripolitania, which was uh, against the will of uh, Britain and, and France. Britain wanted independent Syrianaika. France wanted Fitsan to, taken, to be taken over by, by France. And only and the, Syri the Libyans remember this. They, they owe their independence and their unitary state to us. Now it's being uh, collapsed, and that's very sad. That's, uh, that is really a terrible situation. And uh, thank you for answering in such a straightforward way what I thought would have been a very tricky question on Russia's stance with regard to Libya's uh, intervention. Um, I'm going to now to try, try and make a level field. I'm going to ask a tricky question uh, to Cameron, uh, not to do with Libya. I'm going to ask you about Pakistan. You did serve as the United States ambassador in Pakistan. And you did serve there uh, when there was this uh, big operation that uh, ended up killing Osama bin Laden. And there was a lot of controversy about this, whether or not uh, Pakistan knew about it. Uh, quite frankly, did they know about it? And if they did not know about it, why was this the case? Big set of questions. Um, I'm convinced the Pakistanis did not know that Osama bin Laden was in Abbottabad. Um, there is, uh, in many parts of the world, uh, because of the absence of uh, information, there's a tendency to believe the most clever conspiracy theory that you can come across. And there are a number of them. Uh, some of them have spread to the United States. Even Seymour Hersh, the very well-known American journalist, has contributed to that, and uh, he's just wrong. He, he, the kind of issues that he talks about in, in the articles that he writes, I think, are, are specious and, and, and incorrect. Um, the Americans didn't tell, the, the Americans, we, didn't tell our Pakistani colleagues 
because of our concerns that the news would leak. We didn't tell them, but, but we had no evidence through the time of the raid and afterwards, and any of the information that we got, you know that we picked up an enormous amount of information from the house in Obadabad after the time of the raid. There was no evidence in that uh, intelligence, in, in that information, that anybody in the government knew. So even though it seems to strain credibility that a, a man could live for years within a mile of the Pakistani equivalent of West Point without being noticed, there is no evidence that that happened. And uh, uh, so the, the problem is that the Pakistanis have to deal with the fact, are they incompetent or are they complicit? In fact, they were not competent. They didn't know he was there. He was there. Um, what this means in the long run is that either way, the Pakistanis were humiliated by what the Americans did. And when you're ambassador to a foreign country, you don't want to humiliate people. But that is what happened in that case. Did you know about the operation? Sure. Yeah. Cool. So uh, One word. <laughs> I'm going to now uh, try and uh, wrap up with uh, two more sets of questions. One, I think, is really an inevitable question. Uh, about Israel and Palestine and about a peace process. And this is something that has uh, been with us since basically the onset of the UN era, since the aftermath of the Second World War. But it, uh, it has never seemed more distant and it had never seemed, sadly, in my opinion, re less relevant than it is right now. Uh, so Cameron, do you think that we are going to have an independent state of Palestine in our lifetime, if you were to make a bet? And you already bought, you already used your uh, card of saying, I don't know, once, so you gotta give me an answer. Okay, then I'll say yes. <laughs> How's that? Oh, well, okay. good. I think there will be, uh, uh, the, the, the two-state solution strikes me as the only credible solution and that even the various and very complicated domestic politics of Israel indicate to me that in the long run, it'll not be a question of how that will happen, but when. But when. Now, the issue that comes up that makes it much more difficult is that it was always understood, as I mentioned earlier, that there would be a solid front of Arab states against Supporting. Israel, and that is now breaking down in, say, the changing set of problems, Saudi, Iran, the role of Turkey, these very complicated questions you raised, it's no longer the case that the Palestinian cause is the key thing defining, say, the uh, relation of Saudi Arabia to Israel. It's no longer the key thing defining Egypt's relation to Israel. And so there's going to have to be a new and fresh way to look at this issue that many of the efforts, many of them American, whether it's Bill Clinton, Henry Kissinger, you name it, through the years, that traditional way of looking at the solution probably is not going to work. That said, I believe that there is no alternative to a two-state solution. It will only be a question of what form it'll take, and it will happen in our lifetime. And how about in this administration's lifetime? Very hard to say. One of the difficulties of the Trump administration is we're still learning, even six months into this administration, how the mechanics of this administration will work. So it's not ducking the question. We really are still learning whether the envoys, the traditional State Department envoys, the structures that we had in multinational institutions like the, the quartet and things of that sort, whether or not this administration, with its new style, is going to be able to pull off things that other people weren't, or whether or not it's not going to be able to do it because it's not working in traditional ways. Uh, I'm going to ask you, Vitaly, about something very similar. It's to do with Israel and Palestine. And uh, it is to do with uh, the latest developments in Gaza and that seem to suggest that uh, there seems to be a deal between Hamas and a part of Fatah that is uh, led by... Um, Mohammed Dahlan, who no longer lives uh, there. He is exiled in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, it's not unknown in 
this quarter of the world leader. But uh, did you hear about the claims saying that there actually may be uh, an independent state of Palestine in our lifetime and relatively soon, but the first president of Palestine is going to be Mohammed Dahlan? It depends, it depends on the span of our lifetime, first of all, but uh, <laughs> let's uh, wait a bit. But I think it's inevitable. I agree with Cameron that uh, it's going to happen because there is no any other, I quite totally agree with that, no any other credible solution. Though a lot of Palestinians now are saying that so it cannot be done. We lost all uh, hopes for the creation of the independent state of Palestine. That's why we'll have to switch to the idea of one Palestine, one man, one vote, one uh, state embracing the Jews and Palestinians together, but which it cannot be accepted by uh, Israel as a Jewish state. Uh, so uh, it, it, it makes it even the, the uh, idea that it's the only credible solution even stronger. So we have to stick to that. But how to do that and, uh, is also important, you know, because what's going on, it's not giving us uh, much hope that it can be done shortly. Coming to your question about the possibility of some, you know, uh, restructuring of the Palestinian entity or Palestinian autonomy or uh, Palestinian... Uh, Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I think that uh, it's a more related to some conspiracy theories. I'm not quite... Uh, I, I, I cannot buy all these, you know, ideas about that. Everything will change, and there will be Hamas, Dahlan, uh, Tandem that can come to power. Uh, it's too early to judge. I think the situation is so difficult and so unpredictable in general. But look, you know, some small triggers, you know, can change the whole situation. Look what's happening in Jordan, because Jordan has an Israeli embassy. And look at this attack, despair, desperation of these people who are attacking even Israeli embassy in, in, in Amman. Um, so we have a lot of a lot of uh, violence, uh, you know, on both sides, and a lot of intolerance in a lot uh, of of uh, different uh, types of uh, uh, unpreparedness uh, for mm -hmm. a solution. Well, uh, this is going to be the last question that I'm going to ask the two of you, and then I'm going to let uh, the audience ask questions. So um, it is to do with the refugees, which have, I mean, this issue has shaken this part of the world and much of Europe in the last couple of years, and in particular in 2015. And uh, there seems to be an ongoing situation in the Middle East, in the Middle East that uh, brought about this influx in the first place, this crisis in the first place. Things have not changed or not changed all that much for the better there. And um, after this discussion, I'm not prepared to say that I'm, I'm more of an optimist that things are going to come to a quick end so that there will be no more developments of that sort. So uh, for both of you, and starting with Vitaly, are we, should we be afraid or should we be uh, at guard about a potential another massive wave of refugees in the next couple of years coming our way, going to Europe, but going through, uh, through this part of the world? Uh, for, sh for sure, it's yes. Short answer, because the people will continue uh, seeking refuge in Europe, mainly for economic reasons. They're running not necessarily from uh, armed conflicts, but from uh, poverty, from uh, different grievances, from hunger, from uh, the, the absence of, of uh, vertical lifts, you know, to raise the uh, level of the, uh, you know, wealth and uh, state, uh, status and so on, and education, medical service and everything. Finding all this in Europe, so it will continue. And uh, there will be influx of refugees to Europe. It's, uh, I think, uh, uh, permanent uh, feature of the uh, present day globalization. We cannot stop it. You can uh, undertake certain measures to restrict it, uh, but not, but to stop it is impossible. 
And what do you think, Cameron? What about the same question to you? Well, I agree, but I would, say, I would warn you against looking for the same phenomenon happening twice. The American writer Mark Twain says, history doesn't repeat itself, but it kind of rhymes, rhymes. right? Yeah. What you'll see is probably not a repeat of 2015 not a repeat with the same kinds of people coming. You know, you had Syrians, you had a number of people from Afghanistan, you had a number of people coming from different countries. You may find, we may find as Europeans or as, as people in the West, that um, it's the population pressures and the political developments in Africa that, that caused this. That is, this notion of migration is not just a question for people who are thinking about the Middle East. This is a, a question that is much bigger than just the particular spark of what we saw in 2015. What about expectations of people in sub-Saharan Africa? What about expectations of people in Western Asia? So yes, the problem will be there, and having gone through it once, the mechanisms that Europe uses to try to deal with it will also be changed. So the answer is yes, it will happen, but it may not be recognizable in the same way. It won't happen in the same way. It may not be the same people, and the response may not be at all what you've seen in the so past. it could be different, but that means both could be better or worse. I would just say different. Different. You know? Well, uh, Look, may, may I add a couple sure. of words to that? Absolutely. I think that it's very important to work together uh, on the issue of reconstruction of these devastated areas in the Middle East because it's encouraging uh, this, uh, you know, heavy immigration from these uh, territories, especially now Syria and, and everywhere, Libya, Iraq, everywhere, and Yemen, for God's sake. And uh, I think that, uh, to, to, in, in, to, to put it very shortly, so, you know, Russia is already working on the reconstruction of Aleppo, and we're investing a lot of money in trying to bring normal life to Aleppo. It's, uh, Unfortunately, the Western media is not writing much about that, but a couple of days ago, for instance, one new pharmacological uh, factory in, uh, in Aleppo started uh, exporting medicine to the neighboring states, which is, I think, very good achievement. Good well, guys, thank you very much. Uh, this brings us to the end of the first part of our discussion. I was planning on, I, I, I planned for this to last for 60 minutes, it lasted for 59, and you answered all the questions. So it was really, uh, it was really fascinating. I think this is the first time that we are uh, so succinct and uh, really following uh, the plan. Now I'm going to give a chance to the audience to ask questions. Uh, the floor is open, please. Thank could you, you could you identify yourself yes, so we know? Of course. Of course. Uh, I'm, my name is Valentin Vlasic, I'm a psychiatrist, completely amateurish, uh, but I really like the topic and I'm following it very closely. I have two questions. Uh, first question, you both said two-state solution for Palestine, but there's between 400 and 800,000 settlers, Jewish settlers. More than 40% of the territory in West Bank is held by them, so what do you expect to will be with those people? Will they be resettled? Will they be part of the new Palestinian state, uh, which considering they're probably the most radical of the Jewish people being ready to go there would be pretty hard. So that's one of the reasons why you said that a lot of Palestinians uh, don't believe anymore in two state policies. So it was a solution. So that's the uh, first question. Second question, uh, also a very interesting topic to me, uh, which uh, was skipped, was the Kurdish question. Uh, especially uh, in Syria now, because for the first time we have a big power, the United States uh, standing in line with them. Uh, there is talk of about as 15 uh, U.S. bases in South uh, Syria. In uh, near Taqqa Ben, uh, uh, there is a large, uh, large uh, base being built, just a couple of tens of kilome kilom kilometers from Syrian army. So uh, Syria won't let uh, independence. <coughs> Turkey definitely won't let independence. Uh, Kurds won't accept anything less. Maybe they'll accept some kind of autonomy, but now uh, the United States is in a very peculiar position where uh, sooner or later ISIS will be gone, in a year or two. And this leads to a very, very complex situation here. Uh, if, the, if the United States leaves them to make a deal with Russia, make a deal with Turkey even more, uh, and leaves them behind, then we, we can expect that no other uh, faction will 
in any other small war will, will stand with the United States because they don't know what happened to the Kurds. And if they don't, then they risk a conflict with Turkey. Thank so you. Thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest, correct me, uh, I'm going to suggest that the second question to do with Kurds and the United States is answered by Cameron. And the first one about uh, uh, the uh, Jewish settlers is answered by Vitali. Would you, would you agree, guys? Whatever you say, Vuk. Cool. So I'm going to start off okay. by uh, Vitali and uh, two-state solution and the fact that the Jewish settlers are, in a way, they are uh, scattered throughout the territory in increasingly large numbers. It's a very good question. We remember how difficult it was for, for Israel to evacuate uh, settlers from Gaza. So I totally agree that to make it with the, uh, this uh, huge uh, amount of people, uh, of some of them very radical, not willing to quit, uh, is, will be extremely difficult. It needs a lot of political will, a lot of money, a lot of creativity. But uh, the more the situation with the annexation of lands and building new settlements and uh, widening or en enlarging the existing ones continues, the more difficult the, it will be to solve the Palestinian question, which is, in my view, detrimental to the strategic Israel's interest, to the preservance of the uh, state of Israel. It's, in my view, everything should be done in order to find a solution as soon as possible to revive peace process, to start again, to restart negotiations with the Palestinians. Okay, so I'm going to ask you about the Kurds. Yeah, I mean, uh, I wish my psychiatrist was as well informed about the Middle East <laughs> as you are. Um, so look, uh, those of you, you know, you know, I think about the Kurds, that uh, it is not a community, it is many communities. And one of the things that makes the solution for Kurdistan or a Kurdish identity or what the future of that region is, is that the different groups have enormous difficulty agreeing with one another. You can talk to the KPD, you can talk to the PUK, you can talk to the YPG, you can talk to these different groups. And at the very beginning, it's very hard to find a core of people who agree on what a Kurdish state would be. That's one thing. The second thing is the point you made. You have Kurds in Iran. You have Kurds in Turkey. You have Kurds in the KRG in Iraq. You have Kurds in Syria. So you have all of those countries to varying degrees of their own ability to rule what goes on in their own countries and what we would call the territorial integrity of their countries who would have to agree. So it's a very scattershot kind of problem. There's enormous sympathy in America for the plight of the Kurds. And there is a tendency to try, in many cases, say in an op-ed in a New York, uh, an American newspaper, to try to talk about the Kurds and how the Kurds deserve their homeland as they were promised by Winston Churchill in what, 1922 or whatever it was. You know, um, but this is an extraordinarily complex problem. And so I think it, the best way to think about it is to try to think about the discrete issues of, say, energy policy, or the fight against ISIS, or the question of the future of Turkey, and to see the Kurds in those problems, rather than to say, here is a Kurdish problem from which everything else emanates. Because if you see this as a Kurdish problem from which everyone else emanates, what I see kind of intellectually is you simply create problems and make it more and more difficult for anyone to come to any kind of agreement about the future of Kurdistan. So I think that the wisdom of many Kurdish leaders is to try to say, where do the Kurds come down on a series of issues in the region? And in the long run, if indeed these problems can be solved, the violence, the uh, inter-ethnic problems, the economic problems, that gives a possibility of people to come together and say, what do we do about Kurdistan? But it's a very thorny problem, a hugely difficult one, and often not helped by people who try to make it simpler than it is. It's a very, very thorough answer. And this is, I believe, one of the trickiest, I would say, aspects of this, uh, of this equation. And especially, we haven't had a chance to talk about Turkey and Turkey's transformation over the past decade. But I'm going to ask you a trick question. And please do not 
get into explanation unless you really have to. Uh, if you were to take a bet about who is going out of these three, who is going to join the United Nations first? The state of Kurdistan, Palestine, or Kosovo? Who would you pick? Kosovo. Palestine. Kosovo, Palestine. Okay, we are going to write down these answers, and since we're going to have uh, Cameron and Vitali in the many years to come in Belgrade, we'll see who is right. Now, let's go on. Sir. Next, I'm a journalist with a French New Okay. Um, I have two short questions. One is, uh, what's left after the Arab Spring that was presented as a revolution similar to the one in Eastern Europe in 99? And if you can name one nation in North Africa that is about to become democratic according to American and European standards, and the second one, Cameron, uh, how long <laughs> ahead the operation against Osama bin Laden were you warned? Uh, minutes, hours? <laughs> and we've all seen images on TV of, of American officials watching live the operation. Were you also watching live the operation? Thank you, Thank you for the question. Uh, two questions. The second one is definitely for Cameron. Uh, What's left after the Arab Spring uh, for you, Vitaly, and then you come to answer uh, the Pakistan-related question. And uh, is there any nation in Northern Africa that is moving towards democracy? I think it's Tunisia, the only example of a very successful process. Uh, not only democratization, real democratization, and, uh, but also some uh, promising signs of uh, uh, very pragmatic behavior by the Islamist party of al -Nahda. It's the only case where, in comparison with the Muslim brothers, which behaved responsibly in uh, Egypt, and al -Nahda made it different. Some would argue that uh, things are different in Turkey. Uh, different in what? Uh, Speaking about Muslim Brotherhood. Yeah, but uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, you know, there is no united, a united uh, global uh, Muslim Brotherhood movement. You know, there is some, there are some uh, common values for the Muslim Brothers in different countries, but they are all different. Even one Muslim Brotherhood uh, movement in Egypt is deeply divided between the radicals or uh, proponents of uh, more, more, I would say, violent reaction mm -hmm. to the. Uh, present government and those who would like to reconcile it to be a part of the political life of Egypt. Cameron. I very much agree with Vitaly that uh, it is important to watch Tunisia and uh, it is foolish for uh, countries that are interested in democracy in the wake of the, of, the, um, of the Arab Spring not to help Tunisia. So that's something that I think is, uh, I hope will stay uh, certainly on the European Union agenda and for other countries as well. As for the question of uh, Pakistan, um, uh, we were looking, uh, I was aware of the house in Abbottabad months ahead of time. And yes, I watched it happen uh, on a screen in live time. Wow. Let's go on, sir. Uh, good afternoon, my name is uh, you, you, just, you just need to take a mic so that everybody else can hear you. Good afternoon, thank you for this discussion. It was very interesting and enlightening. Uh, my name is Stefan Stankovic. I'm a student of the Faculty of Security Studies. I have one question for both participants. Noam Chomsky once said in his book Interventions, if you want to avoid American intervention, you need to behave like Iran or North Korea. Do you agree or disagree? And why? Thank you. Cameron, start. I assume that what you're saying is that the only way to prevent the crazy Americans from coming in and taking you out is having nuclear weapons. That was a subtext. I That's the subtext. <laughs> exactly. um, I don't agree. I don't agree. Although there is a sense in many countries, if, in, if you're kind of a follower on Twitter of Kim Jong-un, uh, <laughs> you, you follow these things. But look, you know, the United States is a country that cares deeply about both 
its interests and the interests it perceives of its friends and its values. At various times, there are different weights given to these different things. And the success or failure of American policy is in many cases how convincing that can be. Is this legitimate? Are there, is there a universal argument for certain values, human rights? Uh, are, is there a legitimate argument for American interests in a certain region? But to reduce this to a question that the only way that Americans respond in a blind way is to either bomb people or not, I think is to make a bit of a caricature of the way that American power is, ex is expressed. And so I would say, yes, one of the logics that people in countries that are profoundly anti-democratic, like North Korea, have is to say, if we don't do this, those crazy people will bomb us. But stand back. Stand back and look at that country and the way that country is governed and the problem that country makes for other people. And I think you'll find that it's a much more complex argument than that. Thank you, Cameron. Vitelli? I disagree with that <clears throat> for, for the main reason, which is that there is a big difference between uh, North Korea and Iran. By the way, even if we come to the issue of human rights, which cannot be imposed by force or uh, bombed in by anyone, including the uh, United States, we see the consequences of this, uh, you know, attempts uh, in a very uh, crystal cut uh, form. But still, in, in Iran, we have uh, strong elements of democracy. Of course, it's not the Western type of democracy, but there is a pl it's a pluralist state. There is a real struggle between different political parties, between different uh, forces, groups, of course, within certain limits. But still, it's, I, I think it's a sort of, uh, uh, of, a sort of democracy in, in Iran. At least when uh, I'm reading uh, the Iranian newspapers, I enjoy it. I enjoy it. As there is a lot of uh, freedoms in this country and uh, a lot of pluralist uh, you know, models of this Islamic type. And uh, if we compare between this system and some of the uh, uh, countries, uh, in the same region, in the Middle a in the Middle East, that it's uh, so if Iran you, is much in a better shape. So if you, if, you, shape. if you if you take on aside Tunisia, which we both which we all mentioned here is a, is a good example that needs to be upheld, and if you don't take into account Israel, which is uh, arguably a functioning democracy. Uh, what about Lebanon, by the way? I'm asking you, is Iran? the most democratic country in the Middle East, in your opinion, Vitaly? Iran? Iran. You take out Tunisia, Israel, yeah. and you also take out Lebanon. It's a very specific case. You may elaborate on it if you would like. But like, um, which are the countries that are, in your opinion, more democratic than Iran right now? In the Middle East. In the Middle East, uh, it's very difficult to judge, I just say, because uh, we need some... Uh, very deep, long-term research work done, but, but maybe not leading us anywhere because uh, the countries, uh, the regimes are as they are. You know, there are different models that, are, uh, that, uh, that remain there for decades. Uh, of course, they will undergo certain transformation because there is uh, some process of uh, globalization. There are some values that are being uh, of course, brought by international experience and by uh, the whole international community. But still, uh, my judgment is that we have to, uh, uh, to pay full respect to the models of, of some uh, of different uh, of states. Each and every, so, yeah, of yeah. each and every. Regardless state. of whether they, they, uh, they correspond to these uh, eternal values, which mm. uh, they can come to later, probably. What do you say to this, Cameron? I like, I like his question better than yours. <laughs> <laughs> OK, good. So uh, lady over there. Ujedinjenih nacija u tim kriznim područjima, u svim mogućnostima i načinima da se da se ove prebrode te ti konflikti, kao što znamo da je bilo u prošlom veku, 
razdajanje sa instaliranjem snaga vjerovnih nacija, razoružanjem, raznim komisijama i jednostavno zaštitom ljudskih prava po međunarodnih konvenciji. Ok, so I'm going to let out of politeness my friends to answer first and I'm going to answer and I'm going to answer last. Well, I'll begin by saying only one of us has tried to be Secretary General of the UN. <laughs> okay. Unless there's something I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I, I would gently disagree with kind of the premise of the question. My understanding of the UN is that it's not an organization that goes out and actually engages in conflict. It, uh, if you look at, for example, the Suez Crisis, if you look at you know, uh, uh, other examples in history, the UN is gauges when the fighting stops. The UN doesn't have an army. The UN is not, in that sense, a, a, an action organization. It's an organization, however, that is meant to sustain a peaceful agreement if that can be brokered. So the reason that we don't have the UN on the front lines stopping uh, conflict is that, in my opinion, that's really never been the UN's role. The UN, however, is the correct place to go to try to find a consensus among states once an agreement is found to try to say, how do we keep this the way it's supposed to be? Vitaly? I agree with uh, Cameron, and I respectfully disagree with your uh, despair about the role of uh, critical evaluation of the role of the United Nations. Uh, because uh, if we, you are unfair to the people, for instance, if we take Syria, to the heroic uh, behavior of the people who are working in order to, in Syria, there is an office there of the United Nations, of the special representative, or special envoy, uh, Stefan de Mistura, who is working to help uh, the besieged areas to deliver humanitarian access, uh, going there, risk their lives, working there hard 24 hours a day in order to, to, to solve some everyday problems of the Syrians, to help refugees. The Agency for Refugees is working hard. You know, who is, uh, who is helping refugees in all these huge camps all over the world? Let's take, uh, for instance, Afghanistan. Uh, during all these, uh, you know, years. So I disagree with that. The United Nations, of course, uh, I agree. It hasn't an army. It cannot fight for, with uh, terrorists, but both peacekeeping, peace enforcement, uh, you know, missions are very important for the world community, for, for the global politics. Um, I'm just going to be, I, I'll try and be very brief. Uh, I think that the United Nations uh, is, uh, is locked back in the past. It is a 20th century organization and not much has changed in the United Nations uh, since, uh, since the previous century and, and the world has changed immensely and the type of challenges and the nature of challenges has changed immensely. And um, I belong to a group of people that uh, do believe that there has to be a profound and significant change to reflect the new realities of the 21st century. And uh, I must say that uh, I don't belong to either of, uh, of the uh, schools of opinion, either in the Russian Federation or in the United States, and some of it that's actually remarkably similar from my experience. When it comes to the UN, uh, that, uh, that things are functioning as well. Uh, I believe that this is an opinion of the four-fifths uh, of, uh, of, of the member states. But I think it's a very, very big question, and definitely uh, a serious change in the United Nations cannot be brought upon uh, without leadership of the greatest powers. Uh, the United States, the largest contributor to the UN, still, I hope that this is going to stay the case in the years to come, and also the permanent member, a key permanent member, vital permanent member, uh, that, that is the Russian Federation. Uh, but it's, I think this would get us off uh, on a totally uh, different uh, trajectory. Uh, we are closing, and there is one last question that I did promise to go to my old friend from the United Nations. He's a legend of the United Nations, as a matter of fact, uh, Fyodor Starchevich. Thank you, Hook. 
This is not a question about the Middle East, but oh. having two representatives of the United States and Russia, I cannot really miss this opportunity to ask the following question. Uh, the fact that Mr. Trump <coughs> spoke during his electoral campaign that his intention, and it seems that it seemed at the time, <coughs> to be a pretty firm intention of improving relations with Russia. That, at least I can guarantee for this city, I don't know about the country, but I would think it can be stretched to the country of Serbia, that brought him most of the sympathies in this country because Serbians wanted that to happen. Now, we saw what happened after that expressed intention. I think very soon afterwards, uh, there were uh, huge uh, iron balls put uh, on Mr. Trump's legs. So we are not quite certain what is happening at this moment. Because the news that comes, and notwithstanding the fact that, as Mr. Munter said, the ways of operation of uh, Mr. Trump's team are still being studied. My question is, will the relations between two superpowers in extremely important countries on which many, many things in this world then, would they improve during Trump's administration? And will forces in the United States that may not be drilled with such a course of action still cooperate in, in the achievement of this goal, which I maintain is an extremely, extremely important undertaking? under any administration, but this administration gave an indication that it might happen, and that's why I'm asking this question. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Who's going to answer first? It's not a question, <laughs> but I can. Please. After, after you. So. Cameron. He will start. OK. Um, look, in American politics, I know that you don't mean to meddle in the internal affairs of the United States. But in American politics, what you have is a number of interest groups. Uh, and Donald Trump is unusual in that he well, became the candidate of the Republican Party, which is traditionally a party that, since the days of Reagan, has been um, very tough on Russia in the sense, trust but verify. This was a way that he looked at it working with Gorbachev. The idea is the Russians are very skeptical but feel they can do business uh, with the Russians. The Democrats have at least a tradition of having high expectations, which in the case of, say, President Obama, uh, high expectations that they were not able to meet for whatever reason, that the, the expectations of the speech in Prague at the beginning of Barack Obama's administration uh, about working together and resetting things and working on uh, nuclear uh, armaments uh, reductions, they were not able to sustain that for whatever reason. So there's a tradition in American politics that the two parties have had that has been upended by Trump. What's happening now, as best I can understand it, and I don't represent the US government, but my best understanding of it is that Trump is sincere in wanting to see ways in which the United States can work creatively and constructively with Russia. There are many people and many interests in the United States who are concerned about Russian behavior and are skeptical about the ability to do so people who are concerned about uh, the annexation of Crimea, people who are concerned about uh, the, uh, the motives uh, of Russia in, in other places in the world. And so that's being played out in the United States. I think that anyone in the United States, if given a choice between good relations with Russia and bad relations, of course we'd like good relations with Russia. The question is how we're going to do it. I think one thing that was striking to me when I was ambassador here, and I'd seen that my successor a couple of times removed, Kyle Scott was here earlier, is that we're in a country that wants to be friends with both 
a country that is actually, you know, it's a, it's a country that you have the best of all worlds, the two best friends in the world, Russia and America, you know. Um, it's something that you learn, if we can do that, it would be a good thing. But the interest politics in the United States are such that no one is going to get a free ride. Trump is going to try to do that. People who are skeptical about Russian intentions or Russian interests are going to try to fight him on this, as you've seen by the recent vote in our Congress about sanctions. So the best answer I have for you is there are people who want to figure out a way for America and Russia to be able to cooperate. There are people in America who are skeptical about some of the behavior of Russia. And that's going to be worked out in a very messy democratic system, which is what we have. Thank you. Vitaly, the closing word about yeah, America I, and Russia. I'm afraid that uh, the Russian-American relationship is a hostage to the internal struggle within the United States. And the Russian factor is used against Mr. Trump by his opponents, which is very sad. And uh, for us, it's funny when Russia is accused of uh, hacking uh, or listening to the some institutions in the United States trying to intervene, you know. Is the United States, some, some of my students, I'm, I am, I'm, I'm from time to time also delivering lectures to students. Students ask, are our, if there are any Russian hackers, are they so capable as to uh, penetrate into all these, you know, systems and uh, to influence the American elections, you know. It's, it, it's, it's, it, is, it is funny. But I understand the Americans, you know, because hearing, uh, having uh, been uh, intervening everywhere, all over the world, everywhere, replacing presidents, prime ministers, <laughs> regime change, and uh, Italy, you know, Guatemala, you know, all these cases, suddenly there are rumors that some Russian hacker came to the United States and uh, tried to, to have some influence in the internal, uh, you know, in, in it's, uh, but it's funny, it's funny. And about the Crimea, there are, of course, there are clear-cut uh, double standards. Look at Kosovo and look at the Crimea. We don't care about who is saying what about the Crimea. It's a part of Russian territory. And uh, uh, I'm deeply thankful to the West, which has helped us to realize our uh, old dream of bringing Crimea back to the Russia. Because as Putin said at the meeting of the Valdai Club, so uh, without this coup d'etat in, in, in Ukraine and replacing uh, the legitimate government of Mr. Yanukovych, uh, Putin said, I, I, I hadn't been thinking about the, uh, this annexation of the Crimea. So I think, you know, who, is, who has to blame for that? Now the, the question is over. It would have never be discussed and put under discussion with whatever country in the world. Now, I, I, I wanted to call a break here but I feel like I gotta give a floor to Cameron once more if he wants to, to answer any of this, I would say very powerful arguments. Look, there are times, you, you can tell from the discussion we've had, I've known Vitaly and respected him for a long time, there are times when honest people do disagree. There is room for many appearances. Yeah, there are many, many, room for many disappearances. It's not the American, uh, it's not the American understanding of what happened in Ukraine that it was a coup d'etat. It was an understanding of what happened on the streets of Kiev when the uh, opportunity to grow closer to the EU was stymied by the government that the people in the country threw him out. Russians may not believe that. Honest people can disagree. So that this question of you know, how and how this worked in Ukraine, or why the American position on Kosovo may differ from the Russian position of Kosovo. Honest pay people may disagree, and often do, right? I can only say that in the United States, there is a wide open debate on this. A free media, uh, a very open parliamentary debate, very serious discussion among people, and this is why I thank Vuk for what we're doing here today. That kind of debate is what you need about these kinds of issues, because these are serious issues. Those people like me, who consider themselves friends of Serbia, friends of Russia even, have to agree that sometimes we're going to see it differently. And I can only say that I hope that the civility 
of political discourse, not only in domestic policies, but in international politics, remains that way. Sometimes we're not going to agree. Thank you very, very much. I would like to, uh, to thank you uh, at this stage. I want to thank everybody at this note. I know that there are several questions that remain unanswered, but we do are going to have a cocktail. So, uh, but I have to, to call it a day. We're now beyond, uh, beyond time. Uh, they say that every good discussion in the Middle East uh, has to leave you more confused than at the beginning. So I hope you are more confused about issues related to the Middle East. I hope you, are, you feel better informed about, uh, about the state of affairs in the world. I want to wholeheartedly thank uh, Cameron and Vitali. It was a true uh, privilege to have you uh, guys with us uh, in Belgrade. We are going to continue with, uh, with our activities as a think tank. Uh, in September, there is going to be a new issue of Horizons, uh, our uh, flagship. Uh, magazine. Cameron was a contributor and a writer. Vitali is going to be in one of the future issues. Uh, we are going to try and continue bringing Serbia closer to the world and the understanding of the world closer to Serbia. Thank you guys very much. It was a pleasure.